At the end of World War II, the wife of one Nazi leader killed her family and committed suicide rather than face a world in which her party had lost. But others evaded death in the final days of the war. Some of them lived on for decades, even writing books about their lives. Once celebrities at home and abroad, they vanished from view at the war's end, some into graves and others into hiding. Eighty years on from the war, Eva Braun is by far the most famous of these wives, but at the time she was the most obscure. She and Adolf Hitler had been lovers since 1932, but he had refused to marry her or even let her anywhere near the spotlight of public attention. Hitler believed that his sexual appeal was a useful tool in reinforcing his power, and he didn't want to risk losing that appeal because women thought that he wasn't available. So while Ava shared his bed and his social circle, she never shared the limelight with him, living for over a decade at the fringe of her partner's fame. In the final days of the war, as it became clear that he was going to lose everything, Hitler overcame his concern with his public image and agreed to marry Ava. On the night of the 28th to 29th of April 1945, as the Red Army was storming through the streets of Berlin, Adolf and Eva married in a civil ceremony in his bunker, followed by a wedding breakfast. On the 30th of April, the couple sat down together on a sofa, where Hitler shot himself in the head and Eva ate a cyanide capsule. They'd been married for less than two days. Eva wasn't the only Nazi's wife to kill herself alongside her husband, or the one with the most shocking death. Magda Goebbels was the wife of Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda. Joseph's work had played an essential part in creating and reinforcing the Nazis' hold on power in Germany, and in the dehumanization of groups who the Nazis wanted to destroy. Magda herself played an important role in Nazi propaganda as one of the public faces of Nazi ideals of womanhood. She was a glamorous hostess meeting with foreign dignitaries, a mother and a housewife who women from all over the country wrote to seeking guidance, and when war came she contributed as a nurse and a worker in an electronics factory, traveling to work by bus to show that the regime's leaders shared their people's struggles. As the end of the war approached, the Goebbels were trapped in the Berlin bunker alongside Hitler and others of the Nazi elite. Magda had insisted on keeping their six children with them, maintaining the image of the perfect Nazi family even after others offered to get the children to safety. On the day after Hitler's death, she dressed her children for bed and arranged for a doctor to give them morphine to put them to sleep. She then killed her own children by feeding them cyanide capsules. Having murdered her children, she left the bunker with her husband and the two of them committed suicide in the garden above. Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary and the man who ran the Nazis' head office, was also in the bunker with Hitler, but had the good sense not to trap his wife Goethe and their ten children in Berlin. As the end of the war approached, Bormann's family were in Bavaria, and so Goethe was able to escape to Italy with her children. But while she was safe from the rampaging Russians, Goethe's own body soon betrayed her. In March 1946, less than a year after the war's end, she died of cancer. In a sense, Goethe Bormann had disappeared from view long before her death. Martin, a controlling bully and abuser, kept his wife out of the spotlight, not letting her take the attention that some other Nazi spouses enjoyed. But her final months were still marked by a dramatic absence that of Martin Bormann himself. He had seemingly vanished off the face of the earth, and many assumed he was in hiding. In reality, he was dead and buried in Berlin, killed trying to escape the city, his remains hidden by Soviet troops. The truth didn't emerge until decades later, and so Goethe spent her final months not knowing if her husband was alive. As a victim of domestic abuse, she was relieved at his absence. Scared that he might reappear at any moment, or still committed to him and worrying that she and her children had been abandoned by the man who should have loved them? Like Goethe Bormann, Marguerite Himmler lost her husband at the end of the war, though at least she knew what had happened to him. As head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler was taken into Allied custody when Germany fell, and he committed suicide rather than face a trial for his crimes. Marguerite and her daughter Gudrun were interned by the Allies. 
After several rounds of questioning, her interrogators concluded that she'd not known about her husband's official business or the crimes he'd been responsible for, and she was released in late 1946. Though she wasn't included in the Nuremberg war crimes trials, she faced several proceedings during the denazification program that cleaned up Germany in the decade after the war. Because of her position as a long-term member of the Nazi party, a court concluded in 1953 that she was a profiteer who had benefited from the Nazis. She was sentenced to 30 days hard labor and lost both her pension and her right to vote. Following her release, Marguerite faded into obscurity, living under a pseudonym until her death in 1967. After being sentenced to death for his war crimes, Luftwaffe leader Hermann Göring committed suicide in 1946, leaving behind his wife Emmy. Once an actress on stage and screen, Emmy was one of the most prominent wives of the Nazi leaders, playing hostess for Hitler's parties and state functions. She was a glamorous figure who contributed to the public image of the regime, and her fate after the war reflected this. A denazification court sentenced her to a year in jail for her Nazi activities. On her release, Emmy was banned from acting for five years, ensuring her disappearance from public view. 30% of her wealth, much of it accrued through her husband's activities, was taken away, and she ended up living in a tiny apartment in Munich. She wrote an autobiography focused on her life with Goring, which was published in German in 1967 and English in 1972. But then, Emmy was an old woman, and she died in 1973. Lena Heydrich lost her husband long before the Nazis' downfall. Reinhard Heydrich, a senior SS official and leading perpetrator of the Holocaust, was assassinated in 1942 during an operation by Britain's Special Operations Executive in the Czech Resistance. In recognition of Heydrich's service, Hitler gave Lena a country estate in Bohemia, complete with prisoners who she used for forced labor. As the Red Army advanced into the area, Lena fled, eventually ending up on the Baltic island of Fehmarn, where she turned her husband's former summer house into an inn and restaurant, which she ran until it burned down in 1969. Despite her husband's role and her commitment to his memory, Lena was acquitted during the denazification proceedings. After a series of court battles with the West German government in the 1950s, she secured the right to receive the sizable pension due to the wife of a senior police commander killed in action. Because of her husband's prominent role in oppressing Czechoslovakia during the war, Lena was also tried in that country, though the proceedings took place without her. She was sentenced in absentia to life in prison, but never served her sentence. Throughout her life, Lena remained a staunch defender of her husband and his reputation, despite the dreadful crimes he had committed. Like Emmy Goring, she wrote a memoir, Life with a War Criminal, published in 1976. She died in 1985. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy leader, was a prisoner of the Allies from 1941 when he made an ill-fated trip to Scotland in hopes of negotiating peace. Despite her husband's disobedience of Hitler's plans, Rudolf's wife Ilse remained loyal both to her husband and to the Fuhrer. Years later, the end of the war put Ilse in the same position as her husband, a prisoner in an Allied camp. Released in 1948, she settled in southern Germany where she ran a guest house. She also had a book published containing letters between her and Rudolf during his imprisonment, an attempt to tell his story in his sympathetic light. The two of them remained in regular contact until his suicide in 1987. Ilse was involved with Still Hilfe, an organization providing support to SS members on the run or in prison for their crimes. She lived until 1995, a committed Nazi 50 years after the war had ended. The wives of Nazi leaders faced very different fates. Some died with their husbands. Some were punished for their own crimes, while some continued defending a monstrous regime decades after its fall.